mute my phone, my, uh, okay. okay, and uh, just a second. I'll let you know. Great, we're live. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today. I'd like to welcome you. Um, my name is Sherwat Adwan. I'm Associate Professor and Director of the MBA and the Executive MBA Program at AUC School of Business. Uh, this is session two in our masterclass series where we invite our international faculty from our executive MBA program to discuss the most relevant topics in their areas of expertise, uh, especially reflecting on the current situation we're all in and the challenges we face. Uh, the executive MBA is a world-class program offered at the AUC School of Business, uh, triple crown accredited school, one of the very few and uh, we partner in our offering with uh, Kellogg School of Business, uh, Center of Creative Leadership, and um, uh, SIEBS in China, SIEBS University in China. Uh, it's a global program. It began to be offered at AUC in 2013, and we have our, our proud alumni. It caters to the needs of uh, top management in uh, terms of the content. The, this, you know, the content focuses on leading and changing organizations in difficult times. And also, again, uh, the, the way we offer our modules is on weekends and in different ways in compressed manner so we can accommodate for top management's busy schedules. So again, uh, the program runs, runs every year and it, the duration is 20 months. And it's one of those uh, global programs that are uh, very relevant to the situation we are here. Uh, I'm happy to have with us our uh, one of our own, uh, you know, uh, visiting professors, uh, Professor Milton Zoza, Associate Professor at Nova School of Business and Economics. Uh, Milton also was a previous director of MBA uh, at Rotterdam School of Business and also uh, the uh, Associate um, Dean for uh, Nova uh, and Director of the SIMS program. Uh, again, uh, very nice to have you, to see you again and to meet you again, uh, Milton, and the uh, floor is yours. Thank you very much, Sarati. It was a, it was a pleasure to be here and to uh, be able to participate in this series of webinars uh, from AUC. Uh, I've been working with AUC already for some time. Actually, we helped also, uh, we partnered in launching the SEMS program and I'm teaching now and proudly so in the executive MBA program at AUC. So it's a pleasure and an honor to be here. Um, and um, I'll be uh, sharing uh, in a moment a few slides and a bit of a, a story around this idea of meaning, um, which I think is especially relevant in the times we're living today in this pandemic uh, crisis that we're facing. And, um, and uh, the goal here is on one hand to elucidate a bit further what this idea of meaning is extract some lessons from the crisis we're facing um, and try to understand what that means in terms of our day-to-day -day life, but also uh, maybe some lessons we can take for organizational life and in the context of business, because this is raising many questions out there. And um, we think that this field of meaning can be actually an interesting area to explore. Um, I've, been, I've been working on this for a few years already. And it's interesting to see that now suddenly this has gained so much interest, um, which is a good thing, I guess, in the middle of this crisis. Let me just share the screen now um, with my presentation. Just give me one minute. Okay, so um, let's see, I believe you can see it. Let me just double check. Can you see the presentation on the screen, Charlotte? Yeah? Yes, yes. Oh, great. Okay, so let, let us start. Um, uh, we call this presentation Finding Meaning in Times of Uncertainty, but in reality, you might say that the best word here should be creating meaning in times of uncertainty. Uh, because one of the key messages that we would like to share with you during this um, webinar is that in fact, meaning is something that you don't find, it's something you create. Uh, but we often talk about finding meaning, uh, so we thought this would be more appealing, but one important message is that the meaning is something you create, is not something you happen to find, right? And um, we'll try to relate that to this COVID-19 crisis and to the broader theme of well-being, mental well-being. 
and then try to extrapolate and take some lessons for <clears throat> concerning organizational life. Um, later in the end, we will have time for Q&A, so you can type it up. And uh, I'll try to do my best to answer some of your questions. And uh, if you would like to come back to me for later conversations on the topic, uh, feel free to do that. So <clears throat> let me start off with a with two stories because um, I think it's better to start with something very concrete uh, and from there try to establish what uh, meaning in life can be. Okay. Uh, the first story is something that I uh, encountered a few years ago uh, that uh, I found quite interesting. And it's not, of course, not the only story like that, but you have various uh, accounts of, of examples similar to this one. But this is the story of Ben, who was a, was a Brit and he was a, a military soldier. Uh, and back in 2014, he happened to see a documentary where he saw this massacre taking place of Yazidi women and children uh, during the, um, the ISIS um, war. And um, what was interesting about his case is that um, he was happily married. And they just had his uh, one beautiful baby, a daughter. And uh, suddenly after that uh, documentary, uh, Ben decided to voluntarily uh, leave his uh, wife and daughter uh, to go and fight against uh, ISIS uh, in the war. Uh, and that raises already uh, various questions. I mean, why would anyone with a you know, happy context like that with a a wife he loved, a recently born daughter decides to abandon them somehow and go and fight in their war. And of course, he had to explain this to his wife. Uh, and then the argument he used was, you know, I don't want our daughter to grow up in a world where children are sold or raped or made to drive suicide vehicles into villages. And then in the end, she understood. So he was kind of... Um, translating that decision into something that he actually cared about, including his daughter and his wife. So uh, this has a few important messages. One is that the power of identity and um, you know, that shapes us and forms our values and what we care about and the roles we play in society. <clears throat> and as much as Ben was a family man, he was also a soldier. And that spirit of being a soldier played a very important role in that decision. And that he uh, compromised uh, on this, uh, you know, happiness uh, for the sake of meaning. And so meaning plays a very important role in our lives in determining uh, our actions. And it's a human need. It's a basic human need, as this story shows. You know, it doesn't have to be so dramatic as this case, but we are all confronted with cases where we opt for meaning, even if that means that we might be maybe less happy. So that's one first story that I wanted to share with you that's just to illustrate the importance of meaning. The second story is something a bit closer to home, at least my home uh, here in Portugal. This is Johnson. Uh, Johnson was a, a criminal uh, and uh, he was uh, born and raised in one of the, the poorest and worst neighborhoods here close to Lisbon uh, called Pogo de Morda. And he was, uh, he grew up surrounded by crime, by drugs, uh, and uh, he became a criminal uh, and he spent about 10 years in prison, uh, a few of which, which actually in, in, in uh, isolation because he was a very tough criminal. Um, he never committed murder, no, nothing like that, but drugs, stealing, uh, all kind of um, bad behavior. Um, and um, at some point, I mean, and he progressively uh, uh, got confronted more and more with his reality. Uh, and he had a very strong basis to work from. So his parents were very you know, uh, uh, keen on passing on fundamental values to him. And eventually with support of some critical figures throughout his life, he reinvented his life and geared all his energy. He's a very smart guy, well-versed as well. He can, he's very inspirational. And he decided to uh, gear his life towards helping youth uh, avoiding uh, the same problems he had. So because he understood the importance of context, he understood the importance of parenting, the importance of role models, he embraced that new role. He created a, an academy called the Johnson Academy. 
and he lives still in that same neighborhood, but he's now seen as an example of someone who is there to be a force of positive influence for youngsters uh, and to help them stay at school, support the parents. So, and this brings another element is that meaning is something that is quite malleable and quite uh, something you can adjust. It's contextual. Uh, it's about how you create the storyline that makes sense, but it's also a choice. Uh, and uh, uh, you will see also towards the end that at the end of the day, we always have a choice about uh, what happens to us. Uh, and that is the field of meaning, how you make sense of your reality and make a choice of uh, attributing meaning to that. Hopefully you do it in a positive way, like the case of Johnson, but there are also negative ways of attributing meaning, right? But just to say that meaning is a fundamental aspect of our lives and how we need to cope with our environment. So these two stories uh, highlights the importance of meaning uh, in general. Uh, an important uh, model that I like to include here that I like very much is this idea that meaning is, uh, it builds on personality, it builds on values and motives and goals, but meaning is a sort of a storytelling process, right? Our brain is continuously kind of building up and creating a story. And then when the story is incomplete, it fills in the gaps um, that makes sense to us. So I, I like to see uh, meaning as our own storytelling. And our brain is often telling those stories, even unconsciously. And of course, behind those stories, there's a bunch of things like your personality, your values, your context, your beliefs. But you know, we need that story to make sense. So, so that we can feel uh, at ease and at peace with life, if you want. So um, this idea of storytelling, I think is important as we will see later. And this may be an exercise for you. And what are the stories that you tell about your life that help you attribute meaning, you know, from your childhood, with your parents, with your surroundings, with the place you work, with your beliefs, with your religion. All these things are part of your narrative, life narrative, and that's uh, the bedrock of meaning. Um, so an important aspect, which I alluded to already before, is this distinction between meaning and happiness. Um, and uh, uh, I think it's important to spend some time on that, because uh, sometimes people talk about these almost as if they are interchangeable, and they're not. They are related, but they're not the same thing. Uh, and the best way to describe that is, uh, uh, first of all, with this quote from Rolf Waldo Emerson, uh, a writer from the US uh, from a long time ago, that I think has an interesting description about the purpose of life, right? And he says that the purpose of life is not to be happy. It is to be useful, to be honorable, to be compassionate, to have it make some difference that you have lived and lived well. And when you read this, first of all, he already says that, you know, to have a meaningful life does not mean that you have a happy life necessarily. And if you relate to Ben's story before about his decision to go and fight ISIS on a voluntary basis, uh, everything is in here. It was about being useful. It was about being honorable. It was about being compassionate about those suffering there and to know that you're making a difference and that you lived a life that was worth living. So um, you see here that, he, he, that this description fits that mold of Ben perfectly. But he already understood that, you know, to have a meaningful life does not mean that you will have a happy life. Um, in contrast, if you look at this quote here from Lucy Seneca, um, he actually goes to the core of what a happy life is, not necessarily meaningful. He says that true happiness is to enjoy the present without anxious dependence upon the future. So here you see that uh, the idea of happiness is this sort of present focused joy, right? A careless, unanxious um, uh, uh, ability to enjoy the moment and to have satisfaction in the moment without concerns and worries about the future. Uh, so you see here the distinction. This might be great, but not necessarily meaningful. And the opposite can be true as well. You can have meaningful life but not necessarily happy. They're not mutually exclusive, but we'll come back to that later. Um, so here's Roy Baumeister is a well-known scholar in this field, and he distinguishes it very clearly. Uh, he says that meaningfulness is about this cognitive and emotional assessment of whether one's life is purpose or value. 
right? Is my life worth living? Does it have purpose? Does it have intrinsic value? And it's your cognitive, so you understand it, an emotional assessment of that. While happiness is a subjective well-being, which is to say an experiential state that contains globally positive affective tones, all right? So this is an experiential state, while meaning is a bit of a, a, a continuity, if you want, that we build around our lives. Um, uh, Baumeister and a few colleagues have explored this a bit further, and they've done uh, one particular study that I like, which involved hundreds of people. Um, and uh, they helped distinguish the difference between uh, happiness and meaning by these various variables. Uh, one is that happiness is mainly present oriented. So it's time orientation, as we saw with that quote just now, just focus on the present. It's something we enjoy right here, right now. While meaning is in essence, your ability to integrate your past, your present and your future. And these are continuous efforts to connect these things, connect these three aspects. And they need to be somehow consistent. We will see more about this later. So meaning is about integrating past, present and future. Happiness is about the present. Attitude orientation. Happiness is a taker orientation. And Adam Grant has done a lot of work on givers and takers. And givers are altruistic, other-centered. Takers are about your individual, you know, what you take from it. In a happiness mode, you are basically, of course, focused on yourself. It's your sense of joy, it's your sense of pleasure, and you are in a taker attitude. While in meaning, you can have both. And you'll see later that meaning can be giving oriented, but it can also be taking oriented uh, and very much self centered. But it can be both, but happiness is mainly and by large, uh, by and large, um, a taker attitude. Uh, one important aspect as well is that happiness was not correlated in any way with worry, stress, and anxiety. So if you're happy, it means that, uh, in gen generally speaking, you're not worried, you have no stress, and you're not anxious. While they actually found that people that reported higher senses of meaning had higher levels of worry, stress, and anxiety, which makes sense, right? If your life is meaningful, it means that you care about something that you care about something in the future, that you care about others, that you're trying to help others, and you're trying to become better. And that comes with sacrifice, it comes with setting difficult goals, it, it comes with overcoming obstacles, meaning that you will necessarily have to worry, have stress and anxiety. So to choose for meaning is to choose for a life that is more anxious. It's part of the game. Of course, how you cope with that is critical, but you still see that despite that, people still choose for meaning. Right? And that's an important variable. There's a field of research, by the way, that talks about uh, a, a small set of people, which is a minority, but still interesting to explore, that apparently has a, a, a more relaxed approach towards meaning and doesn't care so much about having a meaningful life. Um, so, but it's another field of research that is interesting to explore. But most of us uh, put a lot of value on having meaning in their lives. Um, and then the, the final one has to do with concerns with identity and self-expression. When you are in this happy mode, uh, this is not present. Uh, people with that report a sense of meaning, they have higher concerns about who they are, about being authentic, about expressing themselves, about being out there and becoming better. So, so this sets a clear distinction between meaning and happiness uh, that I think is important to establish, also to understand the consequences of the crisis in the current, um, in, in, in the sense of well-being, mental well-being. Um, so let's see how is it that meaning in life can be defined. Uh, a very important um, uh, word here for this the difference between the meaning of life and the meaning in life, because the meaning of life is a broader philosophical existential question you know, philosophers like Jean-Paul Sartre and Albert Camus and Kierkegaard and Nietzsche were busy with the meaning of life, right? What is the purpose of all this? That's not what we're dealing with here, although there are some aspects that we kind of learn from those philosophies, but it's more about the meaning in life. So it's a more practical thing about how can you create meaning in your life and not the meaning of life in general. Okay, so meaning is subjective and contextual in the meaning you create. And that's what we're talking about here. Um, so three aspects uh, that are critical in understanding the meaning in life. The first one, and I will explain them one by one. The first one is this idea of coherence. 
And this connects with what I told you about meaning is about integrating past, present, and future. Uh, so uh, meaning is, you know, to report a sense of meaning means that you are also feeling or you understand your life as being consistent, as being coherent, as making sense. So it's comprehensible. It's not, you know, it's like one big puzzle where the, these parts fit together. Um, let me give you a very quick example of, of how this can have an impact. You know, I was brought up um, in Portugal, a Catholic country. And back in 98, I moved to the Netherlands to work there. And it's a Protestant country with a very different contextual cultural set of values. And, um, uh, and for a while, actually for about two years, I was lost. And, and in a way, my sense of meaning was disturbed because life suddenly wasn't coherent anymore. So the things I used to take for granted, the values I used to take for granted, suddenly were gone. So the sense of coherence somehow disappeared. And I had actually a phase of a bit of a depression at that time because I just couldn't integrate that new reality into my view of the world, and that was incoherent. And that incoherence caused distress and caused difficulties for me to cope with that. So that's an important aspect of meaning. People who report meaning, their life makes sense. It's cognitively something they can't understand, okay? Uh, so that's one first aspect. The second, which is something that a lot of times people confuse meaning with purpose. Purpose is a way to get meaning, but it's not the only way. So purpose and meaning are not the same thing. I would say that purpose is a component or a possible way of uh, getting meaning. So meaning purpose is this emotional process where you have a sense of goals and aims and a sense of direction in life, something that you care about and you aim for and that guides your actions. Uh, again, it integrates past, present and future, but by setting up a goal in the horizon that kind of shapes uh, about your present and integrates also your past so that you are geared and working like a missile towards your goal. So purpose can be extremely powerful in creating a sense of meaning, okay? So that's another um, aspect or another dimension of, of meaning. And the third one, which is in a, rec a recent edition, is uh, a bit more of a spiritual stance here, more of a philosophical approach, if you want, um, where people experience their life as being meaningful when they also have a sense that life has inherent value. It's, it's a, a life worth living. And it relates to this Japanese notion of hikiyagi or the Greek notion of uh, eudaimonia, where there's an intrinsic value in life and you experience something almost religious and almost spiritual that makes your life meaningful, all right? Um, so uh, these three aspects, um, coherence, significance, and purpose, can contribute to meaning. They're not exclusive, so you can have different, and they're correlated, but they're not the same thing, right? So purpose can lead to coherence, which can lead to significance, but I can have significance without purpose, for instance, right? So, or, you know, coherence is unlikely. I think coherence is common to, to, to all to, the, to, to others, but they're not mutually exclusive, but they are um, equally important, right? So these three uh, senses are part of how you experience meaning. So going to our coronavirus and uh, what's happening out there and the impact it might be having on um, uh, our sense of meaning. Um, so this is, of course, something very sudden that happens, uh, and the impact on well-being has been tremendous. And of course, we all talk about the deaths and the, uh, the suffering and the disease it's, itself. And uh, fortunately, uh, Egypt hasn't been as affected as other countries like uh, Spain, Italy, or even Portugal. You have much less cases. And yet, uh, I mean, the impact on mental well-being uh, is for sure there, even if not just because of the um, impact on the uncertainty in the economy, okay? Uh, and this is some data that I show you here about the impact that the coronavirus has had in, in various countries. I mean, in the US, about half of the Americans reported suffering with on the mental health uh, issues during the coronavirus crisis be it because of the disease itself, the fear of being contaminated, fear of losing, you know, people's um, close to people close to you, 
but also the uncertainty in the economy and the anxiety that it comes, and employment rates there went through the roof, and that creates anxiety. So mental health uh, issues are, of course, significant. For instance, another important thing that happened in Europe, as in even in Europe, an increase in domestic violence uh, because of that. So serious aspects uh, of mental well-being. Um, in Italy, this is a study during the crisis, at the peak of the crisis, where you know, a vast majority of people uh, reported uh, high levels, very high levels of anxiety uh, during that crisis. And of course, there it was very severe. And the confinement and the isolation contributed greatly to that. But the impact of mental on mental health has been tremendous. And they will continue uh, because the economic crisis will unfold now, uh, meaning that unemployment, uh, people losing their jobs, losing their businesses will increase. Um, but also the scars of the process like this. And I think that uh, one day we will see that the negative impact of the coronavirus has been much larger than just the people that passed away, unfortunately, during these uh, months. Um, and even increasing to that, adding to that, was the fact that um, it was so sudden that it, it got this sort of, this shock element was even greater. I was in Thailand for about a month while this was happening in China. And in Thailand, it wasn't too se severe. And uh, we were wondering whether we could fly back. And we flew back at the end of February. And we thought, OK, uh, we left the hot spot of the virus uh, in Southeast Asia. So I think it should be OK now, only to know that a week later, you know, from one day to the other, uh, everything was entirely shut down. Only this last Sunday in Portugal, we started opening up the economy again, small shops and things like that, until Sunday, everything was closed and it happened like that. And of course, that shock was tremendous, right? Uh, and even the, the hardest and the most resilient of the people, the person would suffer with this. Um, so what is the impact it has on meaning? Well, the first thing, lack of coherence, right? Um, and we talked about it just before, this is an important aspect of meaning. Suddenly, things don't make sense anymore. Suddenly, your normal is pieces, and you don't know where to look at, and you feel lost. Yeah, this is a nice quote from Descartes from 1642. He talks about the sense of lack of coherence already in his own words. You know, it feels as if you have fallen unexpectedly into a deep whirlpool, right, which tumbles around you. So you can neither stand up on the bottom nor swim to the top. Uh, so that's the feeling you get. Uh, and one of the things that uh, good leaders have been trying to do is say, okay, we won't be going back to the past normal. That previous normal won't be there when we start opening up the economy. This will be a new normal. It's a new reality. It's a new context. And we need to start creating new reference points so that we can, again, recalibrate your life so that, again, make somehow some sort of sense. And that might be a source of anxiety, that we cannot go back to how things used to be, right? Uh, but that's a, a direct impact you have. But you see how far people go to ensure that their life still has meaning despite the crisis. So on the need for coherence, I think a good example is how Donald Trump, the president of the United States, has tried through his messages still keep the worldview that he used to have about that reality. This particular tweet here, he talks about the Chinese virus, which is a way of, it's a, it's a narrative that he was already building before about China not being um, a, a friend country uh, from the US, according to him, uh, and also how important it was for the industry to recover, but he was very much around the lines of, you know, we need to go back to this strong, you know, American free market kind of thing where people are free to move around and that need for coherence somehow led to some defensive behavior. I think he adjusted a bit now in the end, uh, but a, a typical reaction uh, when people are, when their worldview is challenged is to react defensively. I did the same in the Netherlands in the beginning when I moved there, you know, I thought they were wrong. And, and I assumed I was right, and they were wrong, and they, 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 they didn't understand me. Only once I accepted that maybe there are different ways, and I started creating new reference points, reimagining my value system, I started making more sense of my life again, 
And nowadays I call myself a hybrid, right? I'm a half Dutch, half Portuguese, my wife is Dutch. Um, I'm a half professor, half businessman. Uh, and I, that was my effort to create coherence out of my own life story, right? So, but that's a very important aspect. The other one is how people, for instance, from the balconies in Italy and Spain, when they were confined to their homes, um, tried to still create a sense of life was worthwhile living uh, by singing and being out there and celebrating life on their balconies, despite the misery of their condition at that stage, to have a sense that it's still worthwhile being around here, right? And that was an effort to create meaning out of a, a crisis. And um, also the same happened on purpose. Like people, many people stood up and started doing things and contributing, volunteering. That's again, how you attribute meaning to a new context. And that purpose helps you make sense of that new life and be able to cope with that new scenario. So these are examples of how people react in an effort to create meaning in their lives, not necessarily happiness, because happiness here, the chances will be limited in this context, but there's a lot of chances to have meaning in this context. Actually, prices probably create the best conditions for you as a leader to create a sense of meaning and purpose and significance. Uh, but it's very much about your ability as a leader to do that. And as we'll see later, the, the, if there's a moment where leadership becomes critical is in a time of crisis. And in my view, leaders who can create a sense of meaning in times of crisis, coherence, significance, and purpose will do better, okay? And we will see, we are seeing some leaders that are failing to do that and they are suffering quite a lot in that regard. Uh, so what, how can be more practical? How can you build a meaningful life? And I will try to speed up a bit to, to, to free up time for some questions. So pathways to meaningful life, how can we, how can we do it? Um, this work here by these authors uh, uh, gives us four possible paths, okay? And I won't spend too much time with the, the, the jargon here, but it's the combination between how much you focus on yourself, how much you focus on others, how much you see yourself as an agent of change or uh, someone who's very action oriented, or how much is it about communion, connection, right? Uh, so the first path is this combination between self and agency. And it's very much about what they call individuation. Is you being at your best? Is you being highly competent? Is you being good at something? And you continuously progressing towards becoming good at something. And that gives a sense of self-worth. And a lot of people, especially more competitive people, extract a lot of meaning from that. Uh, but all of us can feel more meaning if we can feel that we are becoming better at something. That's one path. The other one is this uh, sense of purpose, right? Contributing, helping. It's a more altruistic. This is the giver type. Uh, helping others, volunteering, uh, being at the service of others, um, you know, and in the beginning, actually, the case of Ben is a good example of that, as we'll explain later, that's one way of getting it. The other one is the sense of unification, which is very much about belonging, you connecting with people you care about, with people who share the same values, people you love, and you can get this sense of meaning by interpersonal connection with those you care, and finally, um, this uh, fourth path, which is a bit more abstract, this idea of self-connection, of you being the principle, of you living your life according to this Aristotelian view of a life of virtue, right? You are vertical and you're principled, and uh, you are true to your values and purpose, even if things around are very confusing. They're not mutually exclusive, again, you can have all four, you can all more emphasis on one, but this is pathways to that. Let me just illustrate with um, I'll skip this part. These are some authors in this field that talk about it. Ah, this is an important aspect here. Viktor Frankl, if you want to read uh, about, in particular, about the idea of contribution and purpose, Viktor Frankl might be a good read. It's a relatively easy uh, book he, he wrote on uh, men's search for meaning, which was written after his work, his, his uh, experience in the concentration camp in German Nazi. Uh, he was a psychologist and he observed that those who were able to survive and to cope with the situation better in the concentration camp were often those who were uh, more uh, focused on meaning, and especially meaning about something that was greater than themselves. A sense of purpose, contribution, and an other focus that was important for them to be able to survive and to cope. 
I would also recommend Martin Seligman and Rollo May. We talk more about you know, your strength of being at your best and being the best version of yourself. Uh, and these are the two possibilities here. So let me talk about a few examples, well, fa well known famous examples, all right? So, I mean, being Portuguese, a good example of someone who's very much finds meaning is the sense of individuation and being really good at something is Ronaldo, for instance, and the football player. He's known, if you ask people around him uh, to describe him, he says this guy is obsessed with being always at his best. You know, there's no game he doesn't want to win. There's no, every training, he's always aiming for something slightly better and always increasingly trying to improve himself. And that's how he attributes meaning to his life. He wants to be the best. Of course, he compares himself to others because that's a reference point for him. But that's the path for him is a sense of being the best in his profession, right? Uh, it's, of course, an extreme case, but it's a source of meaning. Of course, uh, purpose, uh, Nelson Mandela would be probably the most famous example here of someone who puts his own life at the service of the nation, at the service of ideals against the racism and against apartheid, also later as a president, as a purpose to unify the country, and always with a strong sense of selflessness, right? It's not about me, it's about something greater out there that I'm serving. Um, at the bottom here, you have another good example, actually from the Second World War as well, Anne Frank, who spent two years uh, hidden in a small uh, uh, room uh, with a few square meters, and the only thing she had was one window and her diary. And the only way for her to express and to extract some form of meaning from her life, which was totally unhappy, was by expressing her thoughts and her experience of the old process in the diary, which became a bestseller later. And then if you visit her room in, in, in Amsterdam, it's amazing how she was able to survive in, in two years. And if we think that we in Portugal were suffering with our confinements in the comfort of our balconies or our gardens in our home, compared to that, it's unthinkable, right? So that's an example of that. And also communion with others. I think um, Mother Teresa could, would be a good example of how someone was able to extract meaning by connecting with others and, and showing compassion and, and you know, having a sense that the life is worthwhile living through that. Okay, so these are famous examples, of course, very heroic figures. But I mean, um, I have more close to home example. This is Laura Decker here at the age of 14 was the, the youngest person in the world to circumnavigate the world alone on a sailboat. Um, she wanted to prove herself, she wanted to be the best, and she extracted a lot of meaning from that. There was a lot of controversy because she was a minor at the time, but she was allowed to do that, and she went around the world alone on a sailboat. Uh, the case of Ben, I think, is a good example, the case we explained before about purpose. Um, and, uh, you know, again, you don't have to be so dramatic, but, you know, if you can uh, create a sense that your life has purpose, it will contribute towards that. Uh, here at the bottom, I don't know if you've watched the movie Into the Wild, where that portrays the life of Christian McCandless, who was a, um, uh, a young man that uh, decided to live alone in the Alaska uh, and to be in deep connection with nature and himself alone. And there was a path of authenticity that he chose. Very extreme choice again, but that's an, a good example of someone who did that. And I think uh, communion with others, every parent that chooses to be more at home, to spend more time with the family or their children is a good case of someone who's choosing for a more meaningful life, a, more, uh, you know, a life of compassion and empathy with those you love. Um, again, these are not mutually exclusive and you can try to have all. And of course, you have cases, I mean, typically, career-minded people might struggle with these two quadrants here between individuation, where you want to be the best and become the CEO and what have you, and uh, keeping a balance with your family, right? So that's a typical dissonance that you might uh, have in your life, and how do you create a balance on that? You know, as, and as we saw, meaning is about coherence. And if you're not able to build a story around your choices that leave you with some comfort about the life you're living, you will feel a sense that uh, at least in some ways it might be less meaningful. And of course, there's no perfect world. You will always have that struggle, but it's a balancing act, the dynamic process of equilibrium you're facing. Um, so uh, 
to the bottom line, there's no rocket science in this, by the way. Uh, none of this is too complicated to explain or to understand, but it's damn hard to implement. Uh, so how do you choose for meaning? One important message is that I think people are overly uh, stressed about having meaningful life often. And they think about, you know, my whole life has to have meaning. And, uh, and they became anxious with that. And actually, there's an interesting thing that Victor Frankl called a, uh, unintended, the paradox of not intending, if you want, right? Um, so by trying too hard to have something, that thing becomes further and further along. Sometimes it's better to think, all right, maybe I don't have to worry about the meaning of my life in general, but, you know, I got up today. How can I give meaning to my day today? Right? and take it in smaller chunks and smaller parts, not being too much worried about creating meaning because that can create actually an anxiety and will force you not to, to, to make it harder and harder. So choose for meaning maybe a day at a time rather than thinking too long term, although that might also be possible, but don't be overly obsessed and overly concerned with that. So in the time of crisis, uh, and I think that holds for any crisis, specifically with the coronavirus, the same it's a very harsh crisis. And you need to embrace and accept the new normal and accept that this coherence will unfold. You will gradually, you will understand. But you need to accept that the, the, the past will never come back, right? If you don't let go of that past, you will live a life of bitterness and frustration. So you need to accept the fact that you know, this new reality is different. There will be new reference points, and at some point, it will make sense. Don't read too much about the bad news. I think just stay informed. I saw people here sometimes who are just obsessed with getting the news and all the time. And of course, your world becomes contaminated with, with, with evil and badness all the time. So it's important to stay informed, but also know how to say no and just read the news once, once you know, a day and that's enough. And then, you know, small things you can do. How can you help others at work, at home, in the community? Sometimes helping contribution doesn't have to be volunteering and go to Africa and help little children, I don't know where, it can be um, simple things like uh, you know, in your family, your friends, uh, your spouse, you know, this sense that you're helping someone, the kids can do a lot for your day that provides meaning to your day. Um, it can also be the crisis an opportunity for you to learn something new. I mean, here at the university, we were forced to learn how to give classes online very quickly, <laughs> at least some of us. Uh, but it can also be about some project you always call a book you want to write, but develop a skill, try to learn something new. Um, Self-connection, this can be a great time to take a step back and think about who, who, what do I care about? What is important for me? What, is, what, is, what are the values I care about? You know, and learn to appreciate the small things uh, and to be more centered, more authentic in that way. And then of course, goes without saying, an effort to unify. And this is probably something you saw happening more. So people reaching out to their parents, reaching out to their friends, even at the distance, and sharing past stories. But that is also a process of unification. I hope that comes to stay because I think we, our lives will be becoming too scattered. But maybe every day when you stand up, you think, how can I activate one of these things or some of these things? And maybe there's something that you can take for the longer run. But having this sort of uh, meaning attitude uh, might help you cope with the crisis. You might be unhappy with this crisis, but at least you can extract some sense of meaning of that and be conscious of that, and that will help you a lot. Um, so a few last tips when it comes to leadership, and this applies both to home and to work. Um, there's uh, this notion of psychological capital uh, that uh, is very much used you know, in the scope of organizations and uh, especially high performing organizations. And it's Fred Newton's work here. And he talks about this idea of heroes. So, psychological capital, uh, in essence, is uh, the amount of psychological power you have in an organization or in your family to deal with adversity. The assumption is that bad things happen. We cannot avoid it. And good leadership is not about denying negativity. It's about taking opportunities, exploring the opportunities that come from the negativity into something positive. And that means hope. Leaders, in a sense of meaning, create hope. Leaders that um, uh, exploit the crisis stimulate learning. 
Leaders create a sense of community that builds up resilience. The leaders have a sense of optimism to create a positive life to cope with adversity. So this notion is very important. And in the end, it's a choice. It's a choice you make in your life uh, about conducting your life with meaning. Again, not necessarily a happy life, but at least a life that is meaningful. And that's it for now. We're running a study, uh, but we can inform you more about that later. If you want to be part of it, we'll be more than happy to share this with you and we can share the results also to AUC. But I'll be open now for questions because I know that I tend to take a lot of time in this thing. So we still have 15 minutes for Q&A. So I'll be glad to take up your questions. Uh, yes, thank you, Milton. Uh, we, we do have a few. Uh, maybe let's take them one by one. How about yeah, that? Absolutely. So I mean, first of all, thank you very much for such an interesting discussion. Uh, in, you know, bringing in the whole uh, coherency, purpose, and significance, and breaking it down that way, I think it's very helpful in dealing with what's going on now. Uh, I really like the coherency component when you say, you know, telling the right story, uh, figuring things out, design, you know, deciding on how things are going to move forward. So uh, for leaders specifically in organizations, how can they create a greater sense of meaning? in the work in the organizations and by, you know, what kind of uh, sense, um, how can they use this in a practical way to create sense uh, of meaning at their work? So, so, I mean, that's a very important question, especially today, right? Because there's a lot of questions that go unanswered. People are wondering what will happen to my job, what will happen to my career and things like that. Um, so in a crisis, that's particularly evident, but even without the crisis, this idea of meaning is important. One of the things that um, we see is that leaders that create a greater sense of empowerment, psychological empowerment, uh, create conditions for people to extract more meaning from their work. And that leads to better performance because they feel more competent, more committed, and more identified with the organization. Uh, so empowerment uh, is an important thing. And it's interesting because it's a combination of a hopeful vision, and that's the role of the leader in a way, and at the same time, creating the freedom within the organization for people to express themselves within that vision, right? Uh, allowing them more autonomy, giving them responsibility and accountability to define their own targets, to, to develop their skills. So a sense of empowerment uh, addresses a very important driver for meaning, which is the need for autonomy and self-determination. Uh, so that, that would be a very important message, is the combination between vision and empowerment as a means towards creating conditions for greater meaning, experiencing meaning at work. Okay, let, let me pick on that one because um, we all like empowering as employees, right? We grew up uh, mainly trying to dissect or separate the uh, work versus home, right? It's actually very professional. We are encouraged that even when you give an excuse that you can make it to a meeting or something, don't use personal uh, excuses that much, at least in our culture, I have to say. So uh, the question is, do you believe that after, you know, right now we're all juggling, everyone's working, I can show you the background, right? <laughs> you know, where we, God knows where we all are and a kid can just walk in. So this whole uh, fine line that used, the very clear line that used to be there, do you believe that when we return back to the new norm, it's going to be different in the way organizational theory uh, in our management is going to approach their employment, uh, flexible working hours? Uh, do you think companies should revisit this based on the, you know, we've all had this, homework environment for quite a while, most of us at least. So, so my view, and of course this is my view, and I'm very much influenced by this field of positive psychology and positive leadership, is that this uh, separation between work and, and personal life is an illusion, right? Um, you can artificially create boundaries, but you cannot avoid being from being influenced. When you're back home and you're coming from work and you're tense because you had a tough meeting, you, know, you cannot just switch off and put up all smiles and you know and, and enjoy life with your family as if nothing happened. And the same happens the other way around. If you're miserable back home, you cannot be at your best doing work. Of course, that doesn't mean that you're not professional and you try to separate the waters and try not to contaminate, but it's impossible to neglect the effect on both sides. So good leaders, while understanding that there are different realities, understand that you're connected. And they, they care about you as a person, not just as a human resource. If you think that work is work, I don't care about what happens in your life, then you're a human resource and you're dispensable. If I treat you as an individual, I care about the whole thing. Of course, at the end of the day, you have to deliver. But I care about you and I understand you as an individual. I think this has 
emphasize that, right? As made that more salient because suddenly you are seeing people at home and you understand their reality. And they're saying, hey, no, they are also suffering with the kids screaming in the background and, you know, and the connection being bad and you know, juggling with multiple things at the same time. So I think it became more obvious. And I think that this will create more openness uh, towards um, uh, flexible working hours, working from home, and more because everyone suffered with that, but more understanding. And the good news is that it leads to more sustainable practices, less commuting, it leads to more efficiency. Uh, and if you keep it in balance, because working only from home is also not healthy, uh, I think it's it can be a good thing in the end. I think it will, people will become more sensitive to this, uh, which is unavoidable. I was just telling here in Portugal, the state has decided to keep the practice of working from home after the crisis for at least one third of public service because they realize they can do the same. Uh, it reduces costs tremendously in terms of office space. It reduces CO2 emissions in terms of transportation. It reduces you know, accidents on the road. It's a win-win-win scenario for everyone. And if you can find that sweet spot, I think you can become much better. Okay. So yeah, that was my point. The sweet spot you mentioned will be take a lot of probably trial and error, I guess, until we figure out what would be the right setup and for every industry and every organization. Oh, yeah. Of course, yeah. so there will be, be a lot different, of different industries. Yeah. Yes, all right. And one final question. You mentioned meaningfulness and happiness as two thing, different things. Does meaningfulness exclude happiness? I, did, I didn't get, you know, like, you want to clarify on that? Yeah, sure. I mean, not at all. I mean, uh, you can have a meaningful life and not a happy life. You can have a happy life and not a meaningful life. But having a meaningful life doesn't mean that you cannot have moments of happiness. And you can for sure. And for instance, let me tell you, uh, significance, for instance, might derive from a sense of happiness. You know, maybe you're surrounded by the people you care and you love, and you're sharing a dinner, and you're laughing out loud, and you have both, right? That moment of happiness gives a sense of worth, you know, that your life is, is, is worth right. living. Or for instance, if you have a purpose, you, know, you want to achieve something, or you want to win a competition, or whatever it is, uh, the process to get there might imply a lot of suffering, right? Which might, which is not happy. But once you achieve that goal, uh, that sense of joy that you get from the process and that moment is, of course, very welcome. So you can have both, and they can coexist uh, for sure, right? So, so don't we don't have to think that oh gosh, for me to have meaningful life, I have to be miserable all the time? Not at all. There's a lot of happiness that you can extract even in the most adverse circumstances. Okay. Um, I think that's all the questions we collected. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Milton, for your, your being here with us today. We're happy, we'll see you soon, hopefully again back at AUC. And um, have, a, have a safe uh, stay at home. Or you're, you're in the office today, right? So yeah, that's- Yeah, today I was at university. I have to be safe on the way. First, first day at the office, yes. Yeah, so yeah. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure and honor and, uh, you know, Godspeed and uh, hopefully we'll see you back in Cairo soon. All right. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.